Well, we're now into the final stretch of Shogun, and there's only two episodes left following Episode 8 just being released. Following the death of Torunaga's son, Nagakado, the mood of the clan was feeling extremely low, and this episode saw that although it might have seemed as though Torunaga was destined to land into the jaws of defeat, duty, honor, and secret plans were revealed, and everything that we saw developed wasn't quite as it seemed. This episode was a really good one. Despite not being filled with action, the conversations that took place were vital to hinting towards everything that's going to come. So let's delve into the episode and break down all that there was to take away from it. Here is Shogun Episode 8 Ending Explained. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. Toronaga's Plan well, I think many of us thought that Toronaga might have had something that was up his sleeve, but I don't think we expected it to the level of this. The intricacy to his plan was so well laid out, and the fact that nobody knew about it other than himself and Hiromatsu showed just how much he could only trust his one and only friend, his most loyal friend. But also the risk that it would pose if spies found out and reported it back to Ishido before it was carried out. The morale of Toronaga's men was extremely low in this episode, Toranaga-sama was adamant that he'd be surrendering to Lord Ishidor, and that then meant that the men that followed him would have to essentially accompany him in a death march towards Osaka, where they'd all then have to die alongside their lord once they got there, something that many of them didn't want to do. They believed in fighting for something, but what Toranaga wanted them to do was the complete opposite, just essentially lay down and give up without a fight. With Yabushigi, Todabuntaro, and others not necessarily mocking Nagakado's death, but considering it to be for nothing because he died by hitting his head on a rock, Omi saw the complete opposite. He saw that Nagakado died fighting for something that he believed in and for his lord, even if he wasn't successful, something that he wanted to do, rather than die for nothing and just give up. As the episode went on, towards the end, it climaxed with Toronaga's vassals meeting with him and refusing to provide their signature alongside his, which was going to be sent to Osaka, which would inform Ishido of the men that would be surrendering alongside him. However, Hiromatsu refused to sign it, following others disagreeing. It was in this moment where he publicly disagreed with Toronaga, committed seppuku, and got his son, Torabuntaro, to second him. This was such a powerful and important scene. Hiromatsu's eyes expressed emotions that words and tones simply couldn't, and the same was also said for Toranaga. These were two longtime friends, the closest of friends, and the fact that Toranaga was unwavering in his decision and prepared to let his good friend die showed just how committed he was to the act of surrendering. Something that he wanted his vassals and also Ishido spies to believe in, so that word would get back to Osaka that Toranaga was genuine with surrendering. It turned out that this disagreement was part of Toranaga's plan and Hiromatsu actually carried out his duty by dying for his lord and being part of a wider plan that was going to be taking place. A plan that lured Ishido into a false sense of security and thinking that Toranaga wouldn't be storming Osaka and instead would definitely be going there easily. This is why, despite Toranaga even having a stone-cold face as Hiromatsu was carrying out seppuku, when the head finally dropped, you could see the emotion in Toranaga's face and the fact that his closest friend had just died. He lost a son and a good friend in a short amount of time, and despite their sacrifices seeming like nothing, they were actually the most valuable things that could have possibly been done. Toranaga also predicted that John Blackthorn would go to Yabushigi and ask to sail his ship under the banner of him, seeing as though Toranaga wasn't prepared to fight, but Yabushigi initially denied the offer. It was only after Hiromatsu died that Yabushigi reached out to Blackthorn and they worked together as allies, something that Toranaga thought would definitely occur. It really shows just how smart he is. This then meant that the next part of Toranaga's plan, sending Mariko to Osaka, could happen. We didn't find out what it was that she needed to do, but I think it's one of a couple of different things. Mariko Toda had a close relationship with Lady Ochiba no Kata when they were younger up until several years ago, as we saw in flashbacks in episode 6. So I think maybe she could be getting sent there to get inside of Lady Ochiba's head, to try and get her to change her mind about who she's allied with. We found out that Toranaga wasn't Lady Ochiba's enemy, but it was instead the fear that she had buried within her. The fear of her safety and her son's safety. So with Toranaga being loyal to the former Taiko and actually having some kind of relationship and looking out for Yechiyo, as we saw in episode 1, Mariko could potentially propose that option as a way of avoiding bloodshed on both sides. After all, many people have been saying to Lady Ochiba that she sided with the wrong person, 
Even Lady Eoy, in her dying breath, told her that Ishidor came from nothing and is nothing, so he's not the man to be alongside. So Mariko could have a pivotal role to play when it comes to them going to Osaka. I'm going to be discussing a spoiler from the novel and the 80s TV series about what's going to happen in Osaka, so if you don't want to hear it, then skip to the timestamp on screen. In previous iterations of Shogun, with Mariko going to Osaka, it's where she actually meets her end. The line about releasing the hostages that Lady Eos said to Lady Yochiba in her dying moments is something that Mariko tries to do in hers. This is why Mariko being tasked with going to Osaka is such an important thing, because her death is going to be something that could be pivotal in changing the tides. Mariko essentially gets killed by ninjas when herself and Blackthorn are releasing hostages, and she ultimately sacrifices herself so that Blackthorn and the hostages can get away. The releasing of these hostages could be the very thing that pushes the generals and daimyo that were being forced to ally with Ochiba and Dishido away from them and towards the side of Toranaga, so that will be interesting to see if it happens. I thought a real beautiful moment came right at the end of this episode though. Toranaga didn't go to Nagakado's funeral due to him being sick, something which I didn't really buy for a second. I felt as though he was doing that to give the illusion and plant it in people's minds that he was weak, when in fact he wasn't. People around Edo were aware that Toranaga was sick and word was spreading, so I think that was also part of his plan. When Toranaga went to where his son's ceremony was, he thanked Nagakado and told him that he bought him some time and that he wouldn't waste it. The fact that Toranaga was now in a state of mourning, it meant that he had 49 extra days before he needed to go to Osaka, which meant that he had more time to carry out his plan. Personally, I loved the fact that Toranaga thanked his son at that moment. Nagakado's death wasn't really getting that much respect from people. But from the person whom it mattered most, it earned the utmost respect and it showed that even though Nagakado was reckless and jumped into things without truly thinking about them, what he did was more than what anybody else had done. And it meant that Toranaga could now carry out his plan with more breathing room. It was a beautiful moment, the moment where Toranaga truly mourned his son and the sacrifice that he made. The Meaning of the Abyss of Life The title of this episode was something that got me from the moment that I saw it. There was a real poignant scene that took place in this episode where I felt the symbolic nature of the title come to the forefront. This was when Nagakado's body was being burned and it cut to all of Toronaga's men that were looking on seeing Nagakado turn to ashes. And this almost hinted towards the fact that there was worry in their eyes about the fact that it could be them meeting their end next. Going into the abyss. Many of them didn't agree with the fact that it seemed as though Toranaga was willing to just surrender to Lord Ishido and have his men be killed, and they knew that they needed to surrender alongside him and ultimately die for their lord, in a way which didn't even allow them to put up a fight. Many of them wanted to go to war with Ishido and at least die with blood on their sword to quote Nagakado, so with them looking on at the ashes in front of them, it allowed them to see their own fate in front of their eyes dying for a cause that none of them really believed in anymore, and dying in a way that none of them wanted to. Mariko and Torobuntaro Within this episode, there was an incredible scene that occurred between Mariko and Torobuntaro. Throughout the show, we've seen that Mariko doesn't really want to be with Buntaro. She never wanted to be, was forced into a marriage with him, and he was also abusive towards her. However, Buntaro loves Mariko deeply, despite the fact that he has a very weird way of showing it. He constantly refuses to let her commit seppuku so that she can be free from what she deems to be the abyss of life. But within this episode, Buntaro wanted to make tea for his wife, to which he did, and she ultimately complimented the way that he made it. And then afterwards, he said that he gave her permission to commit seppuku, where he would then also do it alongside her, meaning that they'd leave the world together. This was a moment where Mariko then essentially laughed at Buntaro's request and said how after all these years, she wasn't being denied death but she was being denied a life beyond his reach. She'd sooner live a thousand years than die with him like that. This showed just how much she didn't care for him and the way that he did for her. This not only showed the fragility in Bentaro's mindset and standing alongside Toranaga, but it also showed that Bentaro had given up completely and that he wanted to die alongside his wife. With Bentaro being left alone in the room and crying, it really did show that he was on his own when it came to his marriage and that Mariko didn't care for him in the slightest. It was a one-way thing, always had been and always would be. She didn't want to leave this world with the man that it felt like she despised most. So even when given the opportunity of a way out, she didn't want him following after her. John Blackthorne's lack of belonging. One of the main reasons that I liked this episode was because we got to see John Blackthorne's mindset for the first time in a long while. Lord Toranaga relieved Blackthorne of his duties and it meant that he was essentially allowed to be free from Toranaga. 
Whilst in Edo, he found out that his men were nearby, and it was when he went towards them where he realized just how different he was to the people that he arrived with. He almost saw his former crew as the barbarians that the Japanese people saw Blackthorn as when he first arrived. The line, he's filthy, was one which I thought was rather poignant as well, because if you think back to the early episodes of the show, when Blackthorn was offered to have a bath, he denied it because he didn't agree with washing regularly, whereas now he was the complete opposite. This pretty much put Blackthorn between a rock and a hard place and made him feel like he didn't have a sense of belonging. He didn't quite belong with the Japanese people as he was a foreigner and wasn't truly immersed within their culture, but he also didn't belong with the people that he once arrived on the land with that were on board the Erasmus. So he was pretty much on his own in that regard, like Omi, not truly knowing where he belonged or what he was fighting for. John's transformation on screen has been one that I've really enjoyed watching. He's so different to the person that we first saw when he arrived in Japan, and the scene where Father Martin Alvito tried to translate for him but he understood John's words wrong and John corrected what he said himself in Japanese showed just how far the character had come and that he's more aligned with the culture and people of Japan when compared to where he once came from. Lady Ochiba and Ishido Right at the end of the episode, we saw that Lady Ochiba went to Ishido and bowed down in front of him, pretty much confirming that she was willing to accept his proposal in marriage. I found the encounter between them at the start to be really interesting. When you think back to when we first saw her and Ishido together at the end of episode 5, she was staring directly into his eyes and was almost the dominant figure. Whereas with this, she didn't make eye contact with him once and was avoiding looking at him the entire time that he proposed the strengthening of their bond. It did make me wonder if she chose to marry him because of what Lady Eeyore said, how he came from nothing and is nothing, making her think that she'd be able to have the upper hand between the both of them. She's already playing Ishido like the puppet that he is, and I feel having that control and power over him will be something that she'll look to have. Let's remember as well, Lady Ochiba's enemy is fear. If she denies the marriage of Ishido, then what? He could turn on her, kill her, and have her son killed so she's most probably fearful of what could happen, but also opportunistic in knowing that she'll have full control. My review of the episode. I thought this was a really good episode of the show, as every episode is. Shogun genuinely gets better and better every week. To me, Toronaga stole this episode. The fact that we saw a man that was putting on a front where he was weak, filled with a lack of hope and was welcoming death, provided a contrast to the strong leader that we saw in the early parts of the season. Toronaga is one of my favorite characters that I've seen on TV in a long while. There's just something about him that you just respect. Whilst this episode wasn't really filled with action or battle scenes, the moment that really did stand out was Hiramatsu's death. The structuring of the conversation, the emotion in his eyes, the tone in his and Toronaga's voice, and then knowing that it was the ultimate sacrifice in order to allow Toronaga's plan to be carried out was just incredible. It showed the weight of the amount of loss that was going to be suffered for Toronaga to be able to hopefully come out on top. He might make it, but who'll be alongside him? Yabushiki? The least trusting of them all. It's something that I'm intrigued to see. I also thought the score in this episode was just simply remarkable. There was one moment in particular which I thought was just beautiful. This was the scene that accompanied Mariko walking out after having tea with Buntaro after she said that she'd rather live for 1,000 years than have to die alongside him. There was a low droning note that just added to the weight of the words that she said, and when the accompanying instruments came in, it just really captured the emotions that were present. John Blackthorn was a character that in the first couple of episodes I found quite difficult to watch just due to the delivery of the lines, but now I'm fully bought into the character. I actually think he's performed so well and his arc has been a real pleasure to watch. It's really interesting seeing how he's lost between two different identities and that he relates more to Japanese culture than what he does English. Him beating up his former crewmate felt like a real symbolic moment that showed that he was now done with that part of his life, and the fact that he and Yabushiki were smiling together on a ship, taking the place of his former men, showed which side Blackthorn picked. The next episode, episode 9, is titled Crimson Sky, so I think we all know what that means. This will most likely be the culmination of Toronaga's plan being carried out. With Ishido and Ochiba believing that Toronaga is going to be surrendering with ease, the tricks up Toronaga's sleeve are most probably going to come out. I can't wait to see what's going to happen when the show returns for its penultimate episode next week. So, there you have it. Shogun Episode 8 Ending Explained. If you want to see more videos on Shogun, then click on the card in the top corner. I've been covering the show since the first episode, and I've also been delving into the real historical figures that the characters are based on. So if you want to see more, then head over to the channel where there's an entire playlist. What did you think of this episode? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. 
As always, thanks for tuning into the video and I'll see you in the next one.